You are most welcome to the session today. It's uh, a SOAS, but also ODI, a joint SOAS ODI event. Uh, and it's a special one because it looks into a uh, one of the most interesting ideas, one of the most uh, uh, promising uh, ideas that has got the scope for transforming the African continent. And that is the African continent of free trade area. And uh, looking at it in terms of specifically of foreign direct investment. Uh, today, we are also uh, uh, fortunate to have with us a number of uh, leading uh, thinkers, uh, intellectuals, uh, authors, uh, policymakers, commentators who are going to share their ideas with us. So, uh, um, the idea um, uh, is very much a brainchild of uh, Doug. Uh, William T. Verde, who is the uh, professor of practice in the Center for Global Finance uh, here at SOAS University, but also uh, is director at the ODI in London. And, uh, you know, together we have a number of people, and I'll be calling upon each one of them and introducing them briefly, and then asking them to share with us their views. And uh, first, let me uh, uh, call upon uh, Professor Ismail Faizo. A, who is a, a professor at the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance at the University of uh, Cape Town. A, and um, is also a former a South African trade negotiator in the WTO, has been in the cut and thrust of those trade negotiations uh, right at the um, highest level. And is currently working on African regional integration and value chains, including the uh, FCTA uh, Secretariat. Uh, so uh, may I invite you, uh, um, uh, 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 Professor Faisal Ismail, to share with us uh, uh, your uh, 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 reactions for opening uh, remarks. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, can you hear me, Victor? I, yes, I can yes. hear you very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, it's uh, such a pleasure to, to be uh, with all of you and to share uh, this platform. Uh, indeed, I wasn't expecting to be the first speaker, so uh, it's a great privilege. <laughs> uh, let me at the outset say um, that I am certainly a, um, uh, a, a great supporter of the work of ODI and, uh, and SOAS. Both are well known uh, as uh, accomplished um, and uh, very um, knowledgeable um, uh, researchers uh, on issues related to economic development um, and uh, issues related to the challenges affecting the African continent. So thank you so much uh, for hosting this event, which uh, certainly is of great interest to me. So let me uh, first um, make some disclaimers. Uh, I, I, I'm not an expert at all, uh, so I don't pretend at all to be an expert on investment. When it comes to trade, I may have a few things to say on investment, less so. <laughs> so uh, I, <clears throat> am, uh, I do have some gray hair, so I'm not going to uh, really speak from a scholarly point of view because I haven't really been following the literature or the current negotiations on investment in the AFCFTA, but um, I do uh, have uh, some general anecdotal comments to make, which I, I will share with you. I am really uh, just as excited, I'm sure, as others to hear from uh, the researchers who've done some research. So I'll, I'll be looking to you to see uh, what you've done and, and some of the ideas that uh, you will be putting on the table, and, and I'll be happy to engage with those ideas. But uh, perhaps as food for thought, I'll say a few things. Um, I just have five minutes, so I'm going to I'm going to make some very general remarks. Um, so my first comment um, is that, um, as you all know, starting from what I know a little bit about, uh, the global uh, multilateral rules based system is broken. I say this was spent uh, more than a decade in, in Geneva. And of course, the jewel in the crown of the World Trade Organization, which is the appellate body, has been rendered uh, dysfunctional. Uh, 
uh, party, you know, by those who have uh, continued to um, uh, veto the appointment of appellate body members. Uh, and of course, um, the WTO does have some important elements that are uh, related to investment. It doesn't have a comprehensive agreement on investment, nor is it the body which um, uh, adjudicates over investment issues more generally, but it has uh, some important elements uh, on subsidies, on trims, trade-related investment measures, on intellectual property rights, uh, and a range of trade-related uh, issues. Uh, the WTO does have some rules that impinge on uh, global investment. So the dysfunctionality of the WTO is indeed uh, a loss for the rules-based system in the world. Now, having said that, and, and I said to you, I'm going to speak anecdotally, I happen to have been at a meeting of appellate body um, judges um, uh, a few years ago, uh, you know, uh, past and present. And, um, and some of them were reflecting on their experience because some of them were also members of arbitration panels of uh, exit and uh, arbitrated over uh, investment agreements. And their view is that notwithstanding the dysfunctionality of the WTO and some of the deficiencies of the WTO system, uh, it was better than the current system, the rules-based system on investment. And the uh, argument they presented was that um, relatively the investment system was, uh, was dysfunctional, it wasn't coherent, it, did, it lacked legitimacy, uh, there was no consistency in the decisions uh, that, uh, that were made by different um, uh, arbitrating uh, uh, bodies, um, and, uh, and it, it, was, it was therefore, it lacked, uh, many of the decisions lacked equity, so the governance system was broken and required reform. So that's my first point. And so any research on what we should do at the regional level uh, must take that into account. So they don't offer too much of guidance about how the regional arrangements should be built. My second point is that, again, speaking with my gray hair, um, you know, for over 20 years of my experience in trade and uh, related issues, um, uh, I've not come across any a strong evidence or, or evidence of strong correlations between um, bilateral investment treaties and foreign direct investment. So there are many who will argue that, you know, the stronger, more, uh, you know, rules that you have to attract investment, um, the more the investment will flow. But that correlation uh, simply uh, is very weak, if, uh, you know, um, and and you know there's not much evidence that um, if you have stronger rules that the FDI will flow. Uh, <clears throat> the third point is that uh, the bilateral investment treaties and the so-called investor state um, um, rules and um, arrangements. Uh, and uh, uh, have uh, been very controversial in bilateral investor treaties. And um, many of these disagreements or controversies um, are based on uh, the criticism that it, um, it is because of the asymmetry between the you know, private companies, uh, sometimes large multinationals, and relatively weak uh, states and uh, um, with, with very little power to uh, engage in and negotiate with these huge companies. And for this reason, uh, the system is under re re review. Uh, and I know there's been a lot of debate and I, I don't really know where we are at this stage in that debate on the reform of the system. My fourth point is that um, 
the AFCFTA for the continent, for us in, in Africa, it creates a fantastic opportunity to build our own rules, to address this question of the balance, you know, what is the correct optimum balance between the rights of investors and the um, need for um, uh, foreign direct investment and other forms of investment on the African continent to support growth and economic development. How do you get that balance right? And how do you ensure that the values and norms of um, African countries, the need for solidarity, uh, build cooperation, uh, ensure that you know investment supports uh, equity, um, and uh, it uh, supports uh, the notion of special and differential treatment, so supporting uh, smaller and poorer countries and uh, players and uh, uh, and getting a you know a more balanced and equitable outcome those are some of the issues that the african negotiators will have to consider as they build their own um, uh, investment agreement and finally i would say that um, odi uh, the uk government um, uh, and and other um, you know northern and um, developed countries uh, uh, that are potential sources of investment would need to be mindful of the needs and concerns of African countries in the way in which they engage the African continent and uh, in the advice they provide about the type of investment agreement that is built for the African continent by the continent itself. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, Faisal. Uh, very, very um, enlightening ideas, and uh, you touched on a very, very key important points that uh, we're going to revisit in the course uh, of um, uh, this discussion. Now, as you know, for the uh, FCTA, the private state engagement is very critical. And now I have uh, the very uh, great experts uh, for you uh, uh, to speak on the involvement of the private sector, especially private sector investment in Africa. And uh, this is uh, Andrew uh, Skipper, who I'd like to congratulate also on his MBE. Yeah, so, uh, uh, Andrew, uh, you are most welcome to uh, this uh, uh, session. Uh, Andrew is the chair of um, Africa Practice, um, the Hogan Roveris, and co-chair of UK Government's Africa Investors Group. This is a very strong group because within that group, Andrew and the name of his colleagues um, um, are working on a, a range of uh, private sector issues, trying to raise uh, investor interest in Africa. He's worked on several major uh, UK Africa uh, uh, investor conferences with UK government. So Andrew can very well uh, uh, give us uh, really uh, important aspects reflecting um, uh, on private sector views around Africa integration. Uh, Andrew, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, thanks very much for the invitation to speak and thank you for your congratulations. I'm most appreciative of it. Um, I'm definitely not an, not an academic. I gave my first ever lecture to, at a university at Bradford University for that annual law lecture about three weeks ago, which is a little bit scary, I have to say. I don't think the professors were particularly impressed by the number of lectures I confess to have attended when I was at university myself, but never mind. <laughs> I'm definitely in the private sector. Um, the Africa continental free trade area is something which um, I think the private sector is and should be excited about, but we understand um, very much the the issues which are faced by um, His Excellency Wem Kelimeni, who I who I had lunch with recently, and who is very clearly a really good guy who really knows his stuff and is really determined to deliver. I've been very impressed, firstly, by the progress this has been made under him. Um, he reminded me how long it took to set up the European Union, um, and this is you've know, got more well, you've got more than fifty countries of extraordinary diversity of culture, economics, rule of law, all sorts of issues, who've all agreed to do this. And I think the the first thing is we can all 
we'll, we will all find barriers and problems with it, but what an extraordinary thing to have happened. And for the, for the private sector, uh, there's a, a the, the positive sentiment coming out and the support given by the African Union, the countries, even including Nigeria now, obviously, and also from countries like the UK, which has got its own um, team in Accra with the secretariat there. I think it's all, it's all good. Uh, but we shouldn't under, underestimate the massive undertaking which is being undertaken by these people. The prize, however, is fantastic, particularly on, on intra-Africa trade, which I believe in 2011, when this started to be looked at, was only at about 13%. Uh, and we've all heard a lot about, you know, I'm always being told about how it's much easier to get ingredients from China and put them in, even though your next door country can't deal with it. So if this is all that, so that there's a big prize there. Um, but underpinning this isn't um, sort of foreign direct investment, but it's uh, intra-Africa investment. It's doing things in Africa for Africa. It's adding value in Africa for Africa. And it's how um, investment coming outside can support that as much as anything else, I think. Um, so the opportunities in no particular order scale, big opportunities for scale. Most uh, There's so many countries in Africa which don't have sufficient scale of the economy to make it justifiable to invest in. If you can invest in um, either, as I know, the auto industry is looking at hubs where you can produce different parts of cars in different places and then uh, collate them, as they put it in manufacturing um, and sell them across Africa, then that becomes very interesting. The, the, the position which Africa could hold in the global supply chain, particularly I mean, it's never going to take, sorry, I may, people may differ, differ on this. It will never take over from China in, future, in, in the immediate future, but it will could easily play a very significant role for supply chains into Europe and elsewhere um, due to its geographical position, but also, of course, with the demographics, which aren't part of this discussion, but which are fundamental to the success or failure of Africa and Africa going forwards. I think the steps which are being taken, um, I'm a great fan of Dr. Arama and Afrex in Bank. So I know you were saying the failures of multilaterals, but I'm a great fan. Um, and the proposals they're coming up with to deal with tariff leveling off um, in terms of essentially subsidizing countries for tariffs, I think are fantastic. And I think the other, I used to, when I started doing this, I used to say there's big issues around currency, uh, certainty and corruption in Africa. Now, currency, they brought out their PAP scheme recently, which people will no doubt know about, which is designed to smooth off currency. So these things are really interesting. And I think that the private sector is looking at this. But so so fantastic opportunities. It, it isn't going to happen overnight, uh, but we're very supportive of it. And uh, I know my African investors group are all very supportive of it. Um, but we are realistic about how quickly this can take place. I think um, what is needed, going back to, my, I think the multilaterals and DFIs do need to step up to the plate and they do need to do development in terms of de-risking projects to make this work. I think that um, the global market is highly competitive, even pre-Ukraine um, and with the Asia Pacific tilt, which isn't just a UK thing, People are just as likely to put their money in in Asia as they are in Africa. And if you add on that the issues which we're now going to have with food security, um, security generally, I think there are there are potential barriers there. Um, currency, I've already already mentioned. Um, uh, and I think the, fi the final point around this is probably certainty. Private sector doesn't mind whatever people may think, doesn't mind rules and regulations. It can cope with almost any number of rules and regulations, as long as they know that those rules and regulations are going to be in place for more than a week. And that if they go wrong, you've got a means of getting restitution or uh, getting your getting your deal done. So the the investment, so the commitment to certainty around this, are we, you know, the issues we had in the last few years with Tanzania, for example, are really challenging for investors. Uh, and if the investment protocol, which is, I was assured by His Excellency, would be in place by September, I, I think they were aiming at November, if that comes in and that works, then, then that will trigger 
much more confidence in terms of the private sector. So fantastically impressed with um, with the with the scheme in the context of you know what we've seen happening in Europe, for example. This is amazing. Under no illusions, it will take some time, but the opportunities and prizes for the private sector and therefore for um, I mean, if, if you listen to Dan Goethe and others, it's clear that the private sector is is the sector which is going to drive success and growth in Africa with the support of the public sector. And I think these are issues which um, hopefully we can talk about later. I think some of these are picked up, Dirk, in your um, in your paper. So I'm really looking forward to to hearing that as best I can. I hope that, you know, positive. Obviously, there are issues multilaterals need to step up to the plate even more than they are doing already, but I don't think we should underestimate what they're doing. So back to you, Mr. Chair. Hope that helped. Uh, thank you very much. That's absolutely helpful. Uh, uh, smashing. Thank you indeed. Uh, so at this juncture, um, uh, I will call upon a duck um, to uh, share uh, his research and his insights. Um, and thereafter, um, I will be able to bring in a um, Hannah, a Martha, and Shireen. So, Doug, uh, you have the floor. Um, well, uh, thank you very much, um, Victor, um, uh, for giving me the, the floor. I think that um, um, we're still waiting for Trudy to um, to join. I think um, uh, we're in contact with her. She might make some remarks in a minute as well. But let's see how it goes. Um, let me also thank uh, so Faisal uh, Ismail. Um, for for his um, his remarks uh, and also for the reminders of uh, from the history um, and the importance that that African countries can now come together to have their own voice on 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 trade rules amongst themselves and that's really important and also um, uh, Andrew thank you very much for sort of yeah also a dose of realism uh, immediately from the start so before we start getting into some of the nitty gritty I think it's really helpful to have those uh, um, uh, those views and of course also for the reminders around um, the importance of intra Africa FDI what it's what it's mainly about right so that's that that's mainly about um, um, but I suppose the um, and let me just share my um, uh, my presentation and I'll, I'll talk for about 10-15 minutes um, the the um, uh, here it is. Uh, I'll also talk a bit more about, uh, and I hope everybody can 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 see this. Um, uh, I will I will talk about the um, uh, an application to UK Africa FDI because that's what I've been working on. Uh, in fact, I've been uh, I worked started working on that 20 years ago. Um, to uh, because then already there was some uh, some interest uh, in, in, in that state. It was, it was Tony Blair uh, with commit com commissions interest to sort of promote FDI to um, to to other um, uh, other countries and um, uh, in particular developing countries uh, and that was unusual. But now there is a more increased interest in particular last few few years. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have some um, something to say on UK Africa FDI. Um, so. Um, uh, I'll be talking about four things. Um, first of all, to think a little bit about the AFCFTA. And um, so officially trading has started uh, under AFCFTA rules uh, last year, January 2021. But of course, there's still practical issues that remain. Um, and so some provisions need to be implemented. So others need to be still negotiated. So I'll talk on that. Secondly, um, I think a little bit on, on how trade rules and investment rules uh, and so in provisions within an agreement uh, such as the ACFTA might affect investment. And I'll do this from a practical perspective, although there is quite a lot of sort of conceptual and empirical uh, um, analysis behind behind it uh, over over several uh, several years. Um, <clears throat> but so I'll, I'll talk talk on that, and I think. Uh, the devil's in the detail, so I will be a bit more nuanced than 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 Faisal, I think, in, in saying that I think there are uh, correlations there, but uh, you, but you need to sort of look for them in a bit more detail. I'll then uh, uh, apply some of the thinking to UK Africa FDI, uh, and then have a discussion on policy implications. Um, uh, from the outset, I should also say that a lot of this work, current work uh, on on investment in the ACTA, is based on work uh, that is being supported by the. The, the FCDO from the UK. Um, so there's also the UK logo there. And in that context, um, there was a program that was launched. And I think uh, Andrew mentioned the lunch that with Mom Kayla, so he came to the UK at the end of March. Uh, and so there's the UK launched a, a support program. And um, 
uh, Trademark East Africa uh, is one of the main implementers of that program, but we are also at ODI an implementer and we're supporting uh, a range of um, uh, of of uh, bodies, um, uh, so a range of organizations, the ACTA, Secretariat, um, uh, of course, primarily, um, but also UNECA and African governments uh, as well, and a range of uh, experts and, and, and think tanks. Um, so let, let, let me go to the, the next uh, slide, if it let me. There you go. Um, it's uh, so on, in terms of uh, negotiations. Um, so the negotiations are are um, are uh, divided into phase one and phase two issues. Um, so normally speaking, you think about trade rules in terms of trading goods, tariff liberalisation. Um, there's still some some work to be done there. Although the tariff schedules liberalisation have been agreed, so which one of the five, uh, ten, twelve years? Um, but um, you also need to agree rules of origin. Faisal, who, who uh, said he wasn't an expert on on the investment, I think he uh, he is, but he's definitely an expert on rules of origin now, and did, a, did an excellent uh, work on that. He can explain more on on that. But there's there's still some outstanding rules here, so for for things to to be uh, applied in practice. Uh, there's also trade and service negotiations, and we support some of the countries to think about the revised offers uh, to the AFCFTA. So which services sectors are you liberalising, or what rules you do you want to sort of uh, submit? to the AFCFTA. Um, then phase two um, uh, of the negotiations um, um, sort of are, are to be uh, concluded soon um, by, uh, by, uh, by uh, November um, and uh, include investment. And so in, in terms of investment, there are already uh, sort of a, a range of, of uh, negotiation uh, uh, um, sessions have, have been had, but um, of course it started a bit uh, later. Um, and then there are some range of other things that are happening. Uh, so women and youth in trade uh, protocol is, is developed and there's, uh, and, and the Secretary General finds it very important that um, that the ACFTA is inclusive. Um, and um, and, and uh, Andrew already mentioned the other tools that, that are uh, some of them which are put in place by the African Bank. Uh, so adjustment funds, for example. So some, some tools for implementation are really important. So there are a range of, of provisions in here. Uh, and it's not just the investment protocol, but there are also other issues in the AFCFTA that, are, that can uh, have an impact on, on investment, both intra-Africa -Af FDI, so amongst the countries that are member of the, the agreement, but also those countries that are outside, um, because they're also looking for, inter for integration uh, within the region. Uh, so some of the issues that emerge around the investment protocol, um, and that's where Faisal started his remarks with, um, is that that well the multilateral system is dead as it were. We're, we're going to Geneva next week, but uh, we'll have to see how, how whether there's any reinvigoration re is possible. Um, but um, uh, let's see what is possible uh, in the AFCFTA. And so there have, there, there have been discussions taking place around the investment protocol. And so some issues that are emerging is around the definition of, of investment. It's a narrow scope. Um, some other agreements uh, <clears throat> elsewhere in the world may have included portfolio investment, all, all types of investment. Here is more uh, enterprise based um, definition is, is likely to, to, to come out of that. There's maintaining government regulatory space is really important uh, for, uh, for health and climate intervention, for example. There is also interestingly uh, um, uh, an emphasis and a shift towards investment facilitation. Uh, so to, to facilitate investment, not just investor protection. Uh, so that was traditionally the case of these bilateral investment treaties um, um, that you would protect investment, you would you would you would give rights uh, to to investors. Um, but there is there is now um, discussion uh, also towards facilitation, so that you put in place national action committees uh, within the country that can really help to to facilitate investment and, and have a pro market um, uh, regime. There are discussions around balancing rights and obligations for states and investors so that they are consistent with national law, consistent with sustainable development objectives. And as was already mentioned, um, there are some discussions about dispute settlement mechanisms around when, whenever there is a dispute and, um, um, <clears throat> and so that there are an African voice and it could look different from what's happened at the WTO. Um, and we hosted recently James Backer, Backer at ODI, who was sort of the, the who was the start uh, the start of the dispute settlement mechanism at the WTO, um, and basically said, well, maybe in Africa, uh, what you also need is, is not necessarily an expensive system. You, but you want to you want to prevent conflicts from coming to the court and and, and have have arrangements for that. And I think Von Kehler Menes' uh, uh, recent speech is really highly consistent with that. There's some challenges around the investment protocol, so it's unlikely to lead to much much more market access on its own. Um, so it may be binding uh, existing liberalisation, but it may not lead to liberalisation on its own. Um, 
and uh, there's still a question mark as to whether it's going to replace the existing bilateral investment treaty. So there are some some that exist around the the uh, within the continent, but um, and what the link will be with those that are with the, the outside of the, uh, the rest of the region. There's some positive aspects uh, as well to all of this um, <clears throat> that. Uh, African countries come together and they signal the importance of investment facilitation, for example, so that they want to have a pro-private uh, uh, sector uh, investment regime. That's really good. There are African debates around dispute settlement, uh, so not the sort of the uh, the, the knee-jerk reactions that that are also he uh, here in UK and elsewhere um, um, uh, about oh we don't want to uh, have think any anything around these these dispute settlement mechanism mechanism. But really thinking about what is the appropriate regime uh, for us. So that's really good. And of course, it allows also to discuss uh, differences and commonalities across uh, uh, African countries towards FDI. Um, now, um, the channels of impact uh, of these provisions um, that, that, that we discussed about um, and how regional integration affects uh, investment, there are three types, I think. So one is that regional integration can lead to a one-off income shift or a more permanent income uh, income growth shift, uh, if you think about more com competitive effects and so on. Um, but either way, there will be an, uh, an increase in incomes um, as a result of, uh, of, of regional integration, as long as it's being implemented. Um, and that will lead to more investment, including FDI. Um, secondly, there are trade provisions. So you can be, uh, become a greater market uh, within Africa, a less fragmented market, and um, that uh, can be an attractive proposition for investors, um, uh, particularly from outside the region, who think, ah, we can now locate in, uh, to inside the region. Within the region, it's more ambivalent because it, you, previously, if you had invested in another country to serve that market, if it now becomes easier because the trade, uh, the trade provisions uh, are, are more liberal, it may also be easier to serve that market for exports and then you can concentrate your location into fewer, um, or your investment to fewer locations. Um, so intra-regional, it's, it's the, the, the effect of trade provisions is more ambivalent, but there is an unambiguous effect of extra-regional FDI um, on, on, on this, and that's, that's been well documented in the, in the literature. It's very strong correlations between, between that. Now then, wh where it becomes perhaps trickier, uh, is about the uh, the investment framework and liberalization and the link between sort of investor protection and investment. Uh, my reading of this um, is um, uh, is that that uh, just signing a piece of paper isn't enough. But if you implement it well, if you are deeper deeper provisions, that will certainly have an impact. Um, and and uh, and that is if you look at um, the, the body as a as a whole. Um, and that's my message for negotiators. Also from that literature is that actually the type and the strength of the provisions matter a lot. It, so if you become part of a region, that doesn't mean that you attract more investment necessarily from from within the region or outside. But if you have particular provisions, um, then it may uh, may help. Um, now we look at UK foreign direct investment, stock of foreign direct investment, that's about 50 billion uh, pounds in Africa. Uh, it was more or less flatline between for a decade up until 2019. Uh, that was a bit disappointing. Um, and um, and uh, UK uh, has uh, its investment hasn't increased as much um, as it as could increase um, uh, as witnessed by other investment into Africa, both intra Africa, so from South Africa, but also um, from, from outside the region. Um, and um, um, and perhaps the, the, the effort of the last few years may pay off in the data when it becomes available. And I think uh, two things to note of, uh, about UK FDI is that actually they have a high rate of return. So profitability in Africa is twice as high as profitability on FDI elsewhere in the world on the, from UK. Um, and UK FDI is mainly natural resources and financial services um, um, uh, as well. Now, if we um, sort of apply uh, some of our thinking to UK FDI, um, then uh, and we look at look at this analytically from a causal chain analysis. We said, well, increased incomes uh, in the region will, could lead to more investment. We know that there's an estimate from the World Bank that says that if you integrate uh, uh, deeply in Africa, that is likely to lead to an increase in GDP by about 7%. Um, of course, if you do integrate less deeply, it will be less. Um, I've, and I've uh, um, uh, estimated previously uh, use, using bilateral FDI data, um, so with pairs um, with Africa and other countries, that um, that FDI um, from the UK to other countries does respond to uh, to an increased income in that country, and that's an elasticity of about 0.7. Um, so we estimate that 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 increase in income could lead to a two and a half billion increase in in UK FDI. Trade liberalisation. Um, 
So there is still quite an, a high um, a tariff in Africa. So yeah, the average tariff is about 13%. Um, if within the region that goes to zero, um, there of course are already lots of zeros within um, sub-regions, um, but if that, if that goes further, um, we think that um, um, that, that um, uh, bearing in mind previous estimates, that that could have quite a bit of an impact on, um, on uh, UK investment as well by about 7.2 billion. And then the predictability of investment framework. Um, if there is a stronger um, investment prote protection regime coming out of this, that will not only be beneficial to intra-Africa FDI, but it will also be helpful for investors uh, outside the region. It will provide a signal, um, as Andrew was saying, that, that uh, it's predictable regime that might not change every week, but at least it's predictable to the African countries, which may also have spillover effects elsewhere. Um, and if we then put that in a uh, in a chart, that we we think that perhaps uh, if uh, the, the 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 provisions are implemented um, uh, in the AFCFTA in, in a deep sense, um, so strong provisions, trade, investment, um, and complementary measures as well, um, then this could uh, could lead to an, to an impact um, of about an increase of 25% in UK FDI to Africa. Um, that is, of course, a top estimate. Because it depends on whether it's really implemented, but it is uh, by nowhere, uh, by no way, um, uh, a strange estimate. There are estimates that um, that suggest that if you become part of a member uh, of a region, that you're a member of a region uh, with strong provisions, that you can increase your FDI by 50% or even more. Um, so, so there there are some analytical thinking on this now. Um, of course, we need to go much more deeply than this, uh, and current work also looks at this. Um, so different sectors are likely to have very different interest in different types of uh, trade and investment provisions. Manufacturing firms, of course, want to see um, uh, tariff liberalization because they need to, uh, uh, and others non-tariff barriers um, because they want to see their um, um, uh, be able to trade goods across borders. Uh, digital investors um, um, are perhaps more interested in the, in the framework on digital trade. Um, financial services may be interested also more about investment rules um, rather than tariffs as such. So different sectors will, will be able to respond differently. Um, we've uh, also discussed with uh, with the private sector during roundtables, but also interviews, and there will be more discussions later on as well. Um, um, but they um, uh, many investors. Um, um, will say that they have an interest in market access provisions, um, for example, a Diageo or a Unilever, um, but a major interest in, in, in trade facilitation measures uh, across borders, also in tariff reductions now rather than later, uh, because they can more easily um, uh, um, send goods across borders, um, and they, that may then lead them to invest in the region to then serve the rest of the region uh, as well. Um, there are also um, uh, investors, and we interviewed one, an, an investor in Ethiopia, who would like to see much more attention to, um, to investor protection. And if the ACFTA can lead to those sort of debates um, around investor protection, about investor facilitation, a more pro-private sector approach, that could then help um, uh, with that debate. A more, it could be providing a more consistent uh, and transparent investor framework. But what the private sector also says uh, clearly, and that came out, is that uh, just signing a piece of paper isn't enough. You need to really implement it. Uh, you need to implement all the provisions on market access, on trade facilitation, and also um, we could be uh, private sector investors really hope that this attention to HFTA uh, doesn't only lead to those uh, those provisions, new provisions, but also lead to a new type of debate between the public and the private sector. And that could then on its own lead to, um, to, to further, um, uh, further measures that are, that are um, um, uh, uh, better for the private sector um, and ultimately for development and economic transformation of the continent. The last slide. Um, now, so um, over the five years um, that we've seen this, uh, this increased attention to the CFTA, um, I, I've been amazed and I think people who followed it uh, about how quickly things have gone. Um, and um, um, Andrew mentioned that he used, it took 30 years and the internal market wasn't really, uh, is, isn't a complete still, <laughs> uh, and there's still, still issues. Um, and, um, um, but there is, there is already quite a lot of uh, work going on at, a, at the ACFTA Secretariat and the momentum needs to be um, uh, kept in place. There are positive views, um, both in terms of our analysis 
um, and in terms of interviews uh, that we've had, um, and both, of course, for this particular piece on UK investors, but also in other work that we've been supporting or undertaking in Ethiopia, Ethi uh, um, um, uh, in um, in Kenya and others, is that there is th that there's really a, a huge potential for the ACFTA to raise investment, both the volumes and the quality as, as well. It is a long-term issue. Um, uh, this is not something that that, that will emerge immediately. Uh, maybe some there might be some quick wins uh, on trade facilitation, but sometimes also even the tariff liberalisation schedules allow you to to not liberalise until say five years, ten years. Sometimes in cases like twelve years, and there are sensitive lists that need, don't need to be liberalised at all. Um, and very importantly, and I think that is also a very important uh, policy implication, is that um, all of this, um, these impacts that, that we talk about depend on the implementation um, and of the ACTA provisions, uh, first and foremost. And so um, uh, that we've been, of course, here before with, with some of the regions, um, sub-regions in Africa, and uh, some have worked. Quite well, the EAC is working much better now, and there's much more dynamics now than it worked like 30 years ago when it when it didn't uh, go that well. Um, there was a tripartite which brought a range of subregions uh, together in Africa, which didn't um, um, uh, go that well. But now there's a lot of momentum here, and there it would be fantastic if there is a a, a great um, uh, synergy between, on the one hand, the, the remaining negotiation issues, and on the other hand, that countries are beginning to implement um, the provision, that they're domesticating the HTA provision into domestic law, that they put in place complementary policies. And that is the second point uh, that, that we really hope um, uh, and there's an understanding also from the private sector um, that 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 this is that is not just provisions that matter, but also what it can lead to, and the, and and the debates that it may foster, uh, the enhanced public-private dialogue that it could foster, and uh, and that's a really important um, message as well, is that for for policymakers and those that uh, and, and and those that help to support um, the AFCFTA as well, is that um, both. Implementation is supported, but also um, the, the 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 other effects that the complementary uh, the, the complementary policy that need to be um, put in place. Um, let me stop here and uh, let me see how I can stop share. Um, don't know. Um, is have I stopped sharing now? I hope so. Um, uh, yes. Um, um, and that we um, uh, so looking forward now to hearing also on other views. Of course, uh, more on Kenya and Ethiopia on intra Africa FDI as well, and of course the China China FDI further um, as well. But let me stop here um, and uh, and just yeah encourage um, further discussion on this, and that this is not just an academic issue. I think and and how we need to approach this, this is very much an uh, 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 an approach that needs to foster action uh, on the uh, uh, on the ground um, with investors. Um, and um, and it's great that we have this this group together, and that can foster uh, further further um, um, debate. Over to you, Victor. Oh, thank you so much, Doug. Thank you, uh, covering so many important issues uh, um, uh, in your intervention and sharing with us uh, your research. Uh, I know uh, in the interface uh, some of the issues which remain, like market taxes and others which will come. Uh, you covered a broad range of issues, both Africa side, also on the UK incentives. I think at this time we'd like to move into uh, the country uh, experiences and look at the country level reflections on FCTA and uh, uh, and, and investment. And I'd like to start uh, by calling upon uh, Martha Balete, who is uh, from the University of um, Addis Ababa, uh, and um, to talk about FCTA and investment in uh, Ethiopia. And uh, Martha has recently worked on a number of uh, papers, including the paper on opportunities and challenges of the FCTA. And uh, please uh, uh, go ahead, uh, Martha, and share with us uh, your reflections. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. It's such an honor to be a, a panelist among all, all, all of you guys. Uh, so what uh, I will try to do is now is to focus on a couple of questions in terms of how, uh, what would be the effect of, of the FCFT uh, to the investment environment uh, in, in the country, particularly with regard to the investment uh, policy making in, uh, in, in the country. 
so I, I looked into the, the classical theories of what are the, uh, the uh, determinant factors of FDI in a, in, in, in a state. Uh, and one of the things that always comes up is the uh, market, the possibility of um, uh, having a, a larger size market impacting positively to uh, FDI flow to a particular country. And uh, as you know, Ethiopia uh, has never been a party to any free trade area. The FCFT is the first uh, free trade area to which the country has ratified. Yes, the country is a member of COMESA, but not the, the COMESA free trade area. So the, the uh, fact that it, for the first time it joined this free trade area, I believe, uh, has the potential of uh, attracting in investors, not just from Africa, but even from uh, outside of Africa, uh, who, who would uh, benefit from uh, the, the larger markets that will, we will create, will be created following the creation of the, the, the FCFTA. So I tried to look at that from that point of view, and, and um, I, I can reach to the conclusion that uh, overall this the the country may benefit from joining this uh, the CFT as a result because of this uh, investment creation uh, uh, potential, and then. Uh, most particularly, uh, I focused into the the policy or what uh, what um, policy framework we will have, which would enhance investment uh, investment to to the country. Uh, so we have right now about 30, uh, 35 or thirty four bilateral investment treaties, uh, which are concluded with developed countries, developing countries from Africa and uh, and uh, the rest of the world. From this 35 uh, or 34, to be specific, uh, BITs, 22 of uh, them are uh, have entered into force. Uh, we, if, when you analyze this bilateral investment treaties, we have we can see a, a stark difference in terms of the kind of obligations, the rights, and so on that we have uh, in, in, with regard to the, the uh, BITs, which are concluded in the 1990s, the, what uh, we call the first generation BITs, and uh, the ones that we are having in recent years, four of, or five of them, uh, the second generation. BITs, where we have uh, matters of uh, investor obligation, uh, protection of sustainable uh, the environment, and other sustainable de development issues uh, being included as as part of the bilateral investment uh, treaty. Uh, so you have those treaty networks which try to govern the the uh, relationship between the investor, the state, and uh, of, uh, in, in general. And on the other hand, we have also the the national uh, investment law, which was recently uh, amended in a couple of years ago, uh, which has shown great improvement in terms of opening up sectors, creating uh, some kind of the perception of predictability uh, for the, 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 the foreign investor. Uh, like, for example, the approach uh, of uh, whether the, which sectors are open, which sectors are closed for foreign investors have been changed to what we call the negative listing approach which is uh, said to be uh, somehow uh, predictable uh, for uh, for uh, the, the investor. Yes, we have those laws, those proclamations, those bilateral investment uh, investment treaties, how they interact, each of them interact with one another is one, uh, one, uh, one issue. Uh, and again, um, having this, uh, the CFT, particularly the investment protocol, uh, I hope and expect that it would create some kind of uh, confidence among the investors in, uh, in uh, being uh, predictable, uh, giving some sense of security for the investors. Of course, that depends on what is going to be within the, the, the specific provisions of the investment protocol, obviously. Uh, when we look at the the uh, the agreement, the FCFT agreement, the framework agreement, particularly on under Article Three, the assumption or the thing that you can see from that is uh, the investment protocol will fo will focus on investment facilitation, more on that in in instead of on uh, creating uh, a scheme for investor protection. But even then, the, this focusing on investment facilitation, is, uh, I believe, is also a positive, uh, a positive thing because we're having 
difficulty, problem, uh, both in terms of trade facilitation and investment facilitation in the country. I may even say that in, in overall in Africa, many African countries will have challenges, particularly with trade facilitation uh, issues where we have uh, lengthy customs procedures in, in, everywhere, uh, non-transparent rules, rules which are found here and there, but may not be easily accessible to, uh, to uh, anyone, to uh, the, the potential investor. Earlier, Andrew has said that the private sector is okay with laws, regulations, but the problem, I mean, as long as they know about it. So that is one of the challenges that we have here in Ethiopia. I mean, uh, they, not all of the laws are easily accessible to everyone. So uh, with this, the, the CFTA protocol coming into picture, one of the uh, the, the expectation that I have would be that uh, we'll become more transparent, more accessible, uh, and the private sector would have um, would primarily know of what what uh, what to expect when investing in in a particular uh, in that part in, in this in this country. Uh, so this is um, basically that I mean some of the, the points that I wanted to reflect, uh, to reflect on. But one of the, the issues maybe would be in, in terms of looking into the relationship between the BITs and the, the, uh, the investment protocol would be what's going to be the, the, um, the fate of the bilateral investment treaties that we have so far. Are we going to replace it with the protocol? This is something that we need, uh, we need to uh, address, uh, address on. Otherwise, uh, as I said, we have two generation bilateral investment treaties, which uh, have different focus, I can say. Uh, and on top of that, when you have a, a kind of a regional investment agreement, which uh, provides something different, then uh, we need to, um, that would uh, make it the system more complex, um, creating some uncertainty. Uh, so that is one issue that I, I believe should be answered in uh, in, in the CFT uh, negotiation. Uh, this is pretty much uh, the, the points that I wanted to reflect upon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Martha. And uh, I can see great insight drawing from your interaction with the uh, colleagues in FCTA, including your own research. Thank you very much. That's absolutely insightful, especially on opportunities and challenges. Uh, and these may as well be cutting across a number of countries in Africa. So next day, um, um, I call upon Sherwin Raga. Sherwin Raga is, uh, has tremendous energy. She's producing a brilliant, fantastic research and has, uh, is not new the Center for Global Finance, having done uh, a recent project on um, um, uh, interbank markets. Uh, so Sherwin, it's always a great pleasure to have you here. And uh, could you share with insight uh, on, uh, on Kenya, drawing from your recent work uh, uh, on, on Kenya? Thank you. Thank you, Victor, for that kind of introduction. So um, let me uh, share my screen. I prepare a let I prepared a, a little presentation. So can you see my screen now? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me. Uh, um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, fine, so, yeah. So this uh, presentation is um, I wanted to uh, share with you the private sector uh, views uh, from that we gathered from representatives of uh, firms in Kenya on issues and opportunities under the AFCFT investment protocol. So this uh, what I will present to you is based on a policy brief that we prepared, the firm survey that we conducted, and the roundtable that we had uh, in cooperation with the Kenya National Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and also this is support. Uh, by the FCDO under the you know or the supporting trade and investment in Africa program. So before I begin, so uh, let me give you a backdrop of um, uh, what the data is telling us from 2015 to 2019. So what you can see here is that Kenya's inward and outward investment has a very strong intra-African component. So between 2015 and 2019, the foreign direct investment from African countries in Kenya has grown significantly by almost 260 percent. And in this year, it has already in this years it has already um, FDI from um, African countries has already outpaced those who, which are coming from traditional investors like in Europe. So this is driven by the foreign direct investment from Mauritius, South Africa, and Tanzania. 
Meanwhile, on the other side, all Kenyan firms that are expanding abroad, are, all of them are nearly in African countries. Uh, the share of outward FDI that is in Africa is 91% total FDI that's coming from Kenya. And again, they are particularly going to EAC countries and um, specifically in Mauritius. So given this very uh, glaring um, uh, strong intra-African component of investment, um, it is natural for Kenyan firms to be interested on a comprehensive AFCFT investment rules that are that will be re uh, definitely relevant for them moving forward. So against this backdrop, uh, we conducted a firm ser survey on AFCFT issues, uh, specifically on the elements of the AFCFT investment protocol, on protection, promotion, facilitation of investment, and also the approaches for outward investment. So I'm just um, giving you some of the key results. So for instance, most of the firms, more than 85% of them are aware of the AFCFTA, but a very little proportion of these respondents are convinced that the private sector is actually ready for the AFCFTA implementation. In terms of uh, investment protection, more than 70% of their, them confirm that there are already legal framework for investment protection existing in Kenya but a very little proportion of this respondents as well believe that the current framework is actually effective in protecting investor and investment. So also most firms view that comprehensive framework in terms of laws, policies, and national strategies for investment promotion in Kenya are lacking. So there's also some issues around uh, interagency coordination there as well. And in order to promote um, uh, investment, uh, coming from Kenya and going out of Kenya, they highlight that there's need to be uh, public and private consultation that has to be um, strong and in place. So these are just a few of them, but of course, these results were validated during the round table that we had in Nairobi in March 2022, where we presented uh, the benefits of the protocol uh, for investment in Kenya based on a review of literature, a review of policy documents in Kenya, and also uh, initiatives on investment code, for instance, the Pan-African Investment Code and other um, investment provisions and commitments of Kenya in uh, regional communities like EAC and COMESA. So based on this, uh, what, what we, of course, uh, this has been raised uh, by Dirk and some of our panelists uh, earlier, that the impact of the protocol will uh, ultimately depend on what is negotiated. So we don't know much of this at this moment, but it is ongoing and uh, what will determine the impact is, you know, how much of the provisions will be binding or non-binding, how much harmonization will there uh, will be adopted in this place. But um, when we look at the documents, we see that, for instance, the Pan-African Investment Code, um, the AFCFTA is... Um, um, is envisioning to, of course, leverage what already is in the uh, the efforts that already made in the continent. So based on past um, policy documents, we may expect that the protocol will include some of these new generation features in existing agreements. So this may lead to a more coordinated approach to enhance investment, emphasize the regulatory space that uh, Dirk has mentioned before on health and environmental standards, and also rebalance the rights on investor and and the state responsibilities and rights towards, you know, um, 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 steering the investment towards uh, the sustainable ones. So um, on overall, it may also attract external investment, even uh, from outside Africa, as the AFCFTA implementation may improve the governance and, of course, the MFN principles. And... Um, we may expect that because of this um, um, uh, continental approach, it will contribute significantly to a common African voice on sensitive issues like dispute settlement and investor protection. So the private firms generally agree with what we presented on the potential benefits of this and validated the results of our survey, but they highlight specific points and measures that are needed in order to boost intra-African investment, but also alongside with it, the uh, trade integration as well. So first and foremost, Kenyan firms express that they need to be involved in the discussion and negotiations of this investment protocol. So they express that they face challenges that is uh, important to be considered uh, during these negotiations. And of course, this one already has been um, 
praised by skippers. So they also um, highlight the need for the predictability of investment policies across Africa. Most of them also uh, you know, highlight the um, connect interconnections between investment and trade and highlight that in order to boost both, you have to facilitate seamless cross-border logistics in terms of both physical infrastructure and border fees in roads, rail, air, and water transport. They also highlight that they they don't know, they, there's less facilitation of information flows. Where are the investment opportunities? And if you really want an intra-African approach, you have to increase the market linkages between and among African investors across the continents. And lastly, they highlight the complementary policies that are needed. They're talking about free movement of people, interoperability of financial system, increasing the linkages between foreign direct investment and SMEs in order to fully harness the investment policies that may come out, out of the AFC FTA. So let me stop there and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Sharing uh, that was a comprehensive, uh, you know, third work survey, um, which generated uh, absolutely exceptional uh, insight and exceptional data, uh, which um, uh, you know some of these insights I was, uh, frankly, a person I was not aware of. So thank you very much, Sherry. We now call upon a uh, uh, Hannah Hannah Ryder, uh, the CEO of uh, Development uh, Reimagined. A, and especially to give an insight into um, uh, the FCTA on Chinese investment in Africa. That angle of Chinese investment is particularly important. So, Hannah, please take it away. Thank you very much for the opportunity to join this discussion um, and to listen to some very uh, useful and interesting um, presentations and, and discussions on this important topic. Um, just to uh, just to introduce my firm, we are um, an African-led, African-owned international development consultancy. We're based headquarters in China, um, but we also have offices in the UK and Kenya. Um, and definitely as a consultancy uh, and, and personally as well, working in this sector for over, for close to 20 years, I would like to definitely associate uh, with Professor Ismail's opener that the system is broken and hasn't really worked uh, for African countries as a whole, but we have an opportunity um, to do so. Um, and certainly, but it won't be easy, you know, um, this has been these kinds of structures that we see uh, in terms of Africa's uh, relationship in, in terms of global trade and investment are patterns which have been there since uh, the beginning of colonial times. So prior to that, of course, uh, when, when African societies exercised much more discretion over what we could produce uh, we were much more interconnected with trade and production elsewhere. So it really is breaking out of cycles. And I'll come back to that as well um, with respect to China. Um, but my, my task here is really to, to speak about uh, the relationship with Africa with, between AFCFTA and China. Um, and, and to give you a bit of a background on that, we know that, of course, and it's been mentioned before, China is Africa's largest bilateral trading partner. So not quite as large as, as the European Union as a whole. Um, but the combined trade value is 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 high, um, 187 billion um, US dollars, and it is uh, in in 2019, and it's fairly balanced overall. But when it's broken down to a country level, the vast majority of countries have trade deficits with China, and this was referred to earlier, um, I think, uh, with the with the intervention. Um, but it's that's also not an unusual pattern. The UK, for example, also has big trade deficits. Only 13 African countries have trade surpluses with the UK, um, slightly less than for China. But the pattern is notable because China was not one of the one of the colonial um, uh, uh, partners. So um, most of the African countries that have ratified the AFCFTA, that you know the vast majority of countries have. African countries have, but they're also, the vast majority of African countries are also signatories to the Chinese-led Belt and Road Initiative. And that overlap really, um, and certainly from a Chinese government point of view, really paves the way for greater strategic cooperation. Um, but it paves the way for African governments to think about trade with, with China much more strategically, to close trade deficits with China and to use the AFCFTA in such a way to do so, maybe even with others. 
um, also because many of the infrastructure development projects which have been carried out with China um, underneath and as part of the Belt and Road Initiative do also provide an important foundation for trade expansion on the continent. Of course, they make supply chains work better, et cetera, et cetera. We know all of that. Um, and indeed, there's a lot of progress which is envisioned in the latest agreement between China and African countries, which was made in 2021, in November 2021 in Dakar. So that ta target, that agreement, for instance, had a target for China receiving 300 billion US dollars worth of African imports over 2022 to 2024, and 300 billion uh, US dollars worth of annual trade by 2035. So that would kind of just about double um, double the trade. And it would, d meeting these kinds of targets, and these targets are very unique. Um, we have, we don't have any, there are no other development partners that have this kind of target with, with African countries. That would make China Africa's largest export destination. So um, China would then, uh, Afri that would surpass the EU, um, which has really been importing around 100 billion um, of African goods for years. Um, and if, from a Chinese perspective, if those trade targets were met, the African region would become as important for trade as the Latin American and Caribbean region is now to China. So it, it would make a significant difference. But today, all of this has arisen with a very kind of ad hoc and uncoordinated um, kind of way of doing things in terms of trade. It's very bilateral. We have BITs, we have DTAs with China. Um, we have one African country which already has an FTA with China, which is Mauritius. Um, and so then the effects and the benefits are quite difficult to determine, and they're not really strategic, as I mentioned. So, you know, things like um, the current manufacturing component of foreign direct investment um, from uh, in, a foreign direct investment from China into Africa, the manufacturing component is around 12%, which is quite it's fairly similar to others. But and you know, the UK, for example, has has got fairly similar um, uh, component, but they have more extractives in their foreign direct investment, while China has construction. So it's really a case of how can China kind of shift that investment in, from construction into, um, as well as to, to some degree, extractives um, towards manufacturing, for instance. So there are a number of different options for greater coordination between the AFC, FTA and China. We have, um, and my colleagues uh, have written numbers of papers on these. Um, we've talked about, uh, and one option being the kind of business as usual status quo, um, uncoordinated approach, you know, we see a continued increase in trade and so on, two-way trade increasing, but it's not necessarily moving in the strategic direction in line with the AFC FTA. And things like rules of origin then could also have significant impacts, again, uh, if, if that wasn't um, if that wasn't coordinated properly. Another option is um, a kind of greater coordination between the AFC FTA, AFC FTA and, and Belt and Road Initiative in relation to um, trying to channel Chinese foreign direct investment into priority countries and sectors supported by the establishment of economic zones. That's something which is quite unique to China um, as an investor. And economic zones for China have a dual role, not only in terms of policies, but also practically because they're zones where infrastructure, for example, for manufacturing is very can be very well developed versus the rest of the country. So they can act as a sort of mechanism for, for, for channeling uh, that kind of infrastructure and investment if if countries don't have have that for the whole for the whole country. So the aim of that would be really to accelerate opportunities for Chinese manufacturing to offshore to African countries, something which which um, would again be in line with AFC FTA and kind of regional integration. Another option would also would be to uh, use the AFTA as a hook to create a preferential trade framework between the AFC FTA and BRI. So kind of modeled along the lines of, of a GOA, but without the specific country, um, uh, without kind of using it politically, but using that as a kind of AFC FTA and China um, type of agreement um, with a view to then moving it into moving into an FTA, for instance, between China and AFC FDA, when 
the African continent is ready and in much of a in in more of a situation that it's not um, so dependent on extraction um, as a as a mechanism for trade. So each of these options um, we have their advantages and drawbacks. Feasibility is different, but you know as a as a firm, our recommendation is is really around um, and what we see as well in in the in the China and Africa deliberations. Focac um, is is a kind of move towards uh, the the channeling of FDI into economic zones and the channeling and the continuation of things like LDC preferences and establishment. There were some new um, agreements around things like green lanes, which are sort of fast track processes for um, bringing in bringing in African products into China. And in many ways, to be honest, this kind of evolving relationship and that kind of transition is something which we would recommend also for the UK, though perhaps with a slightly different um, kind of strategy for foreign direct investment, which would be based on UK specialization beyond the extractives and, and financial services. But I just want to mention something very briefly about what does this mean for the investment protocol, because I know that's really what we're talking about today. And I know I've given you a very kind of broad overview. I think as an analytical firm and also having assessed the investment landscape that Chinese investors are used to, I think the definition of what is a better investment climate, and I say investment, better investment climate in, in uh, with the parentheses, because Chinese investment, Chinese investors' idea of what a better investment climate is might be very is actually very different to what UK investors might think is a better investment climate. So, for instance, um, special economic zones matter, um, and the environment for special economic zones matter. Um, but also aspects around, around actual policies. So in China, the view of strong intellectual property rights being the key to ensuring innovation is just not there or wasn't there and is understood that it's not necessary. And in fact, given more recent economic models and understanding of open innovation, you know, we take a very agnostic view or, or we don't necessarily agree with the traditional kind of um, uh, arrow approach of of of, uh, of strong intellectual property rights being the basis for for investment. Similarly, the evidence on benefits of formalization in business, especially at early stages of, of development, is or at the stage at which you know African countries are at now, not you know kind of middle development, is very big, is is fairly mixed. And again, we see that in China. So that's something which is not absolutely necessary for them. Um, and similarly. The, we take a kind of nuanced view on the degree to which investment is deterred or not um, by instruments like low taxes, um, because those instruments can involve domestic trade-offs, you know, higher tax revenues can support infrastructure development. And fundamentally, that kind of thing, the infrastructure development aspect and security in some ways is much more important to Chinese investors than um, lower taxes. That's just not going to attract them um, uh, uh, necessarily. So I think it's a very important for the AFC-FTA investment protocol to be taking into account the diversity of investors, the diversity of investor interests, and just be careful about not kind of pigeonholing into this particular type of view, but also creating the environment for, for others. Um, and the other point to mention would just be also thinking about the AFC-FTA's linkages to other parts of Agenda 2063. So in particular, things like um, uh, the Africa mining vision, um, visions around food security and agricultural production security, health security, et cetera. These are all crucial and, and very important to kind of think through how can, the, how can the protocol be developed in such a way that it encourages local manufacturing, that it encourages green uh, investment in, in green technology um, and, and disincentivizing kind of the, 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 the business as usual kind of extractive investment in technologies. Um, and how does it how does it create the space for things like carbon taxes, create create the space to just say fossil fuel subsidies are not the right thing that we want. Um, so those sorts of aspects, I think, are also very important to recognize. And I think including with a view to shaping the future of Chinese investment into the continent. And we can do that, I think, quite proactively through the investment protocol. So thank you very much um, and look forward to discussing going forward. Thank you. 
and thank you very much for ending on such a, a very positive uh, note. Uh, the basically uh, absolutely helpful. Um, um, I think this conversation will definitely go on, you know, even after the end of this uh, discussion. I will now open the discussion to the floor. Please uh, uh, put up your hand if you want to ask a question. Uh, there is um, um, a panel where you can raise your hand. I, I will not sit, or Asina will not sit, and then we can call upon you to uh, share your intervention. Um, I had also requested for some comments in the chat. Uh, I'll check that and see. Please um, uh, raise your hand just in case you intervene. I will, uh, and after that, I will ask Dak maybe to come in a little bit more on some of the points that were raised by our colleagues. Um, I don't see any hands up at the moment. Maybe what I will do is, uh, yes, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, Dak, please come in again. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. So uh, I, mean, I, I think the, um, there are fantastic contributions um, and uh, highlighting, I think, a number of issues we need to discuss uh, or, or need, need, clear, uh, need, need to be clear on. Um, I think uh, one issue is around um, uh, simply about sort of empirics on the importance of investment rules for investment. That link uh, does it does that is that uh, uh, is there a link or not? And if so, how how is how is the link? I think I don't think we completely settled on that um, uh, in 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 the in the discussion so far. That that I think is one issue. Second issue is that what we all would like to see is that ACFTA uh, and its investment protocol can lead to more predictability of the investment regime. Um, is that going to happen? Uh, how? How is that going to happen? What needs to be done? I think that that is an important uh, discussion to be had. So is that the, the current investment protocol, the current directions that it's taking, is that the way to go? And that may well be it. Um, um, I, what I also very much like is the sort of the, the, the comment from Hannah, and maybe I want to bring that back to Marta. Maybe you can have some some views on that. Is basically um, is is how how can the investment protocol be used to channel Chinese FDI into those areas um, that that are beneficial uh, to uh, so bearing in mind local manu uh, local manufacturing, but also uh, greener issues. Um, uh, I know that there is there are commitments in in the protocol towards sustainable development. Um, how how does that work in um, in uh, in practice? So how can how can the investment protocol link back to AU twenty sixty three um, um, uh, uh, discussions? Um, I think the um, uh, maybe I should stop there. But I think that uh, I, I think there are a couple there are two those two um, two question marks. I think the other the third one is is about external engagement, and I think. Um, that is a that is a big debate, of course, not just about in, in terms of investment, but also in trade more generally. Is that um, is that there are a number of countries in Africa that have bilateral trade deals um, and have also bilateral investment uh, deals and, tra and treaties. So, what is the how is the sequence? What is the appropriate sequence? How do, uh, what, what is best here? Um, is that do we now does it need to be standstill and ACTA needs to be um, uh, developing? Uh, it, it's a template, as it were, that it can use externally. And there are discussions in the UK and Kenya, for example, the discussions uh, that Hannah mentioned about Mauritius and, and, and China. Uh, oh, there's already agreement. There's already agreement between some North African states and US. Um, so there are already uh, sort of uh, external uh, agreements that perhaps constrain the, um, the, um, the, the content of of an ACFTA, as, as Carlos Lopez uh, Lopez would, uh, would 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 say it. Um, but how 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 do how what do we think here? Um, uh, sort of with all the bits, the bilateral investment treaties that are just between amongst African countries and also with externals and, and the link with ACFTA. I think there are quite a few uh, discussions there that, that we could have. Uh, I don't know whether Marta has, has an interest, particularly around how can the investment protocol be used um, to to sort of channel investment investment. Does does Ethiopia do it already, for example? With its investment law. Uh, well, Thank you very much, Dark. And before I um, invite uh, Anna to respond, uh, let me so also uh, throw around a couple of comments and uh, get some insight. I'd also like to get some insight from a uh, Faizo, uh, if, uh, if if possible, to um, this whole idea of the fact that uh, in um, in an integration, what FCT should help us is collective negotiation especially on some of the sticky issues. Okay, does that collective negotiation work? 
Uh, we know in the past it has proved difficult, but then there was no such a binding body. Do you see the prospects of collective negotiation in some of the three cases working? Okay. Um, and uh, to uh, Sharon, uh, um, having looked at uh, the um, collected the data, granular data from the, do you think that a uh, uh, there are strategic sectors, especially you know, in the these strategic sectors that should be like the leading sector? You have this uh, huge literature in development economies that say you know leading sectors and so forth. Uh, you can concentrate on those leading sectors, and then that will provide the push. A, uh, for, for takeoff, do you do you see anything like reading sectors um, uh, in in the data, or uh, was that covered um, 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 at all? Uh, so um, I'll stop here now and ask uh, um, Hannah to respond first before we go to Faisal and Sharon. Thank you. I th I think maybe Martha could answer that question better than I could, um, <laughs> or I could add to what Martha will say. But Martha, go ahead. Please. Okay, we get both uh, Martha and Anna to weigh in. Absolutely, why not? Yeah, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I was just wondering and in looking into how, what the relationship between TIP and China is in terms of the investment. Uh, China is one of the, the, the largest investors uh, in, in, in the country. And then uh, we have much of the investment is uh, on, on the, we have the bilateral investment treaty also. Uh, so I would uh, I would assume that uh, the the investment, the existence of the BIT with China, has uh, created some kind of confidence on the investors to come here. Of course, much of the investment could be the the investment. I mean, from the government of China. But uh, so um, the probably this one uh, could also help uh, uh, in, in that regard. But so far we have we have that uh, in investment flow uh, for, to, to to the country. Uh, uh, thank you, Anna. Yeah, so I think I, so, so building on what Martha was saying, so I think the the BIT does help. But for example, I think more it was it was in many ways the the china ethiopia example is is more a kind of alignment very much between between governments and and visions and it was almost like a pilot for <laughs> ethiopia has kind of acted as a pilot in many ways for for chinese manufacturing going into I, into african countries i think the challenge is obviously also because of the war there've been issues around security etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's why i said those sorts of issues are actually potentially more significant than and the logistics are potentially more significant than you know kind of offers of of this kind of low tax environment or or kind of general facilitative environment it's those kind of fundamental points um for that that chinese investors will will really care about um but the bits can um can enable that but i also think the way the existing bits with china in particular are kind of very standard um, and and kind of not not particularly differentiated. So and and they also don't necessarily have the kinds of um, the kinds of points which I've just made are not necessarily incorporated into those. So so they have to then have separate agreements on things like security, etc. So um, it, it would be I think talk going back also to what Victor's point was on kind of collective. Uh, negotiation. I do think there's a role for ex at least exchange of information on these sorts of issues. You know, what is, um, how how can African countries get the most out of different development partners with different um, particular characteristics? And there's there's room for that with regards to China, and there's also room for it with regards to the UK also. Um. Much, uh, Hannah. So let me now go to a uh, uh, Faisal and then Sharon. If I can unmute, yes. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I'm really um, been, you know, uh, amazed at the um, the different ideas um, that have surfaced, and uh, actually very stimulated. As I said, I'm I'm not an expert, but I I really think that. This is a great opportunity for the continent. 
So what we have to do is first um, disabuse ourselves of uh, of being wedded to the pet uh, mainstream ideas uh, because the world has changed. And uh, in many of these mainstream ideas were driven by, uh, you know, the main um, uh, protagonists of uh, FDI. So, for example, the OECD was the main source of FDI for many decades. Uh, so now you have a new reality. I was very intrigued by the research that shows Kenya's source of foreign investment is mainly, uh, you know, increasingly intra-regional. That's very exciting. So it's a new source of investment. And then, of course, Hannah's uh, presentation about China's role in Africa and, of course, the targets and where that is going. And, of course, we know we've seen the data on the trends of foreign investment by China has been growing faster than anyone else, especially in infrastructure. Uh, so uh, what this tells us is Africa has new opportunities. Uh, to, to tap investment. And I think that Hannah's point about listening uh, carefully to the different uh, interests and concerns of different investors and how best to attract that investment. So Africa needs investment. We need it from anyone, <laughs> from everyone in the world. We need it to support economic development because we're just so far behind everybody else right, across the board. And we know that the uh, theories that suggest magical stimulation of the economy are just not real and will not work in Africa. So for example, all the models that predict increased trade flows uh, by trade liberalization, you know, will create growth. Uh, and I've written a book uh, called Developmental Regionalism and the AFCFTA, arguing, I'm not really interested in disputing that, I'm really arguing we need four different pillars to move simultaneously for Africa to really get the benefits of regional integration. We need asymmetrical trade, that means, you know, we're all different. The Seychelles and Malawi are not the same as South Africa and Nigeria. <laughs> So we have to practice solidarity between ourselves <clears throat> and see how we can find ways of, you know, building balanced agreements internally. We need industrialization and the trade agreement creates the opportunity for regional value chains to build the competitiveness of the continent. It has never happened before where, you know, industries like the automotive sector are driving a regional um, production system across the continent. First time. Can't this be done in a number of other industrial sectors? We started work on cotton textiles and apparel, for example. We know in several other areas in agriculture, this is indeed extremely possible. We know that the war is creating challenges for wheat imports in Africa. We don't need wheat imports if we can produce more cassava, uh, for example, but we can do this better if we cooperate with each other on the continent and exchange technologies. And I do agree with Hannah that the old theories of, you know, more um, protection for uh, intellectual property rights is not necessarily the answer for industrialization and uh, techn technology transfer on the African continent. So third, we need infrastructure. Most of the infrastructure was going outside uh, the continent because it was just extractive. Now we want intra-regional flows. How do we encourage cross-border investment and then focus on both the hard and the soft? So I know I was in a meeting the other day with some of my old friends from Geneva and I asked them why you guys are not implementing the trade facilitation agreement. They said, well, you know, we were not driving that. I said, well, you know, you need to implement the one that we have agreed to in the AFCFTA because it's one of the annexes of the, the trade uh, agreement of the trade protocol. 
So the AFCFTA is going to drive that process of implementing trade facilitation, both soft and hard infrastructure, you know, that has to be built to encourage intra-regional trade. So that is necessary. Then, of course, governance. We have to have increased governance, both economic governance and political. On economic governance, very relevant to the discussion on investment. If you just get all the basic principles of economic governance right, you will encourage investment. Predictability, security, transparency, respect the rights of uh, investors, but also respect the rights of people, of stakeholders, of trade unions, of communities, of women, you know, um, of landowners, of peasants, you know, and you will get, if you have a balanced approach to the different rights on the continent, uh, you will encourage investment, you know, uh, you, you both domestic investment, but also foreign investment. So I think the tremendous opportunity for the African continent to debate how it can become an actor, it can build agency in building norms and values about uh, global rules in the context of the African continent that we can also maybe share with other regions and maybe even shape the multilateral system of governance. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Faisal. Uh, you know, very insightful, and you added to the points uh, uh, but explored these new points in new, new dimensions. Uh, uh, Sherin, maybe I can ask uh, you to intervene here. Yes, um, thanks for that question. So um, uh, the roundtable discussion, we gathered several interests and, you know, these are a combination of firms, small firms, big firms, expanding firms within uh, in Kenya and, you know, those who wanted to expand in the re region. So we've seen like, you know, there are, in the, there are uh, representatives that are very uh, active in the logistics sector, and they are highlighting that because of the intricate relationship between trade and investment, and you know investors getting their products out, so there's a greater need to facilitate that only the industry, the manufacturing industry as well, but also the logistic industry. So we're talking about connectivity between road, rail, water, and air transport so that it can facilitate trade and encourage investors in this uh, booming industry. I also wanted to um, um, maybe share not um, um, uh, some comparative advantage that we've seen in the Kenyans context. So this is not, uh, this is a separate study from this uh, policy brief. So we studied before product level analysis on trade or export imports from Kenya and what are their ex um, advantages based also on their partners. So, you know, the bread and butter of Kenya, of course, is its horticulture, agriculture, but the, how how do you put value in it? It also depends on how you comply with international standards, how you comply with like value adding, um, value adding, value added to this products. For example, in China, they wanted like uh, China is a big market for tea, but then uh, uh, we found that you know in Kenya they market consumers, of course, wanted some Chinese translation on the tea. So how do you increase, you know, um, the value of Kenyan tea in terms of packaging them at the consumer level and, you know, tailoring it to international standards, then that that would also, you know, um, increase the value, increase the income from that industry. Um, so, yeah, uh, but besides from this um, comparative advantage industry booming industry there are also like cross cutting like uh, emerging industries in kenya that in, it includes fintech for in, for example kenya already has the white technology financial inclusion has gone through and they're expanding you know to, uh, in uh, other countries as well so these are just so um, yeah, these are some of the leading industry, and of course, you know the wider, uh, the wider literature uh, from economic transformation perspective is that, of course, um, it, it's the manufacturing sector that actually leads for income and also human capital uh, accumulation. So, besides from the emerging, we also have to steer the investment towards this um, high growth income generating sectors. Thank you.
Uh, thank you so much, Shirin. Um, one one question um, um, well, issue that when we talk about the um, African continental free trade uh, area and FDI, we sometimes um, a um, one important sector, which is basically um, uh, trading services, if they are that uh, you know trading services, uh, for example, uh, banks that's financial services, insurance that's financial services, medical and hospitals that's uh, you know um, you know medical services, the law, the law firms. Uh, maybe this is a conversation we're going to come back to at another opportunity in the future. But does anybody have any insight or bring us something uh, interesting here? Well, who wants to respond? Yeah, I can see, I can see Faiso, you are ready. Yeah, yeah. And so then, uh, when I was writing my book, I was trying to understand what's happening on the African continent um, at the level of production. And what I found was very interesting that the old uh, conceptualizations of the and definitions of what were so goods and what services, you know, is really blown out <laughs> because you you have um, a mixture of this increasingly globally, but in Africa we see that um, services um, in many countries is um, uh, an opportunity for uh, production for and for job creation. For example, you know, in Nigeria, the largest job creator, well, one of the largest, is um, the third largest um, uh, uh, film industry in the world, Nollywood, employing over one million people, uh, small producers. So it's services, it's job creation, it's production. Uh, it's a mix between the two. And so uh, I think that, you know, we shouldn't be too wedded to the concepts and the differences. We need all. We need we need uh, we need manufacturing. Uh, you need uh, you need productive activity, and you need services to support productive activity on the African continent. Uh, we do need to be aware of, and we need to regulate against unproductive services, um, financial services, for example, that you know prey on. Um, you know, uh, African countries through, you know, high levels of volatility. So how we manage uh, this is, is very important and how we regulate those services yeah, is very important on the African continent. Uh, but yes, I do agree with the point that you're making. We need to give equal attention uh, to services. Uh, some of the services sectors, uh, I just came from Tanzania, where tourism is a, a major um, you know, job creator and has huge potential. Uh, but of course, we've got to make sure it doesn't become just an extractive sector, doesn't exploit, you know, uh, the poor, doesn't destroy the environment, <laughs> uh, but, you know, is a higher value added, um, increases the skill and, uh, and, and makes an adequate contribution as well to the economy of the country and doesn't just extract through, you know, the way in which some of these um, Travel in the travel industry works, where you, you you pay up front in the country that you that you're going from, you know, in Europe, and then there's very little or trickle down that goes to the um, service providers at the very local level. So those are very important things that we need to take into account. But the hospitality industry and the, and the tourism sector is just as important, I would argue, uh, than you know, agriculture or manufacturing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Faiso. Shall I bring in Hong, Hong and then um, Dak will conclude. Uh, Hong, please. Yes, sorry. I am um, actually, I'm on my phone, so i um, just uh, <laughs> speak. So um, that's a really, really um, good session, good discussions for me because I'm, uh, I'm a Chinese myself originally, and I'm interested in Africa and the relationship between China and uh, Africa. So in terms of uh, economic uh, trade, international trade and investment. But I'm thinking about 
a, a, a little bit uh, a higher level issue here. So I'm now an academic um, for maybe 20 years now, more than 20 years. I have been hearing this type of discussions for so long. So for example, when I was doing my PhD, as far as uh, African investment or international or trade issues are concerned, people have been talking about similar things like we, we have today. So my concern is, why is still the case that we, are, we have to be concerned about the env environment, the, 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 uh, how to attract investment? So there has to be something else. There has to be more than just uh, that African countries have to create a friendly environment so that uh, they attract uh, foreign investment or oh, intercontinentally, the same logic. So I'm thinking, you know, think about China. So we started um, maybe 30 or 20 years ago, China was at the stage that China needed so much of foreign investment. Now, after 20 or 30 years, China is investing everywhere, you know, globally, and particularly in, in Africa. So I'm thinking, is that the, the stage now we need to consider investment efficiency, for example, to evaluate what kind of investment that have created efficiency, that have promoted Africans' economic performance. Because without that, we still do not know where, you know, people are attracting and attracting investment. They put a lot of effort, money, but then we still have the same issue. So I do not know how to solve this, but maybe that's something that, uh, that I'm concerned about in terms of African development, development and investment and international trade. So I do not know the answer, but I think uh, yeah, we need to do more than just uh, talking about how to attract them. So that's my concern, sorry. Uh, back to you, Victor. Uh, thank you very much, Hong. Very important observations. We are running off time, but I think I should allow Emilia to take one minute and uh, put across a view, and then Doug will conclude the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Victor and colleagues. Uh, and many, many thanks for an insightful uh, discussion. Uh, just to, to make a suggestion towards um, uh, Hong's last question, uh, uh, at least from the investment law field. Uh, I think one of the answers might lie in each state taking an audit of where it is, where is it that these inflows come from. If I take a parallel from the world of investment investment law, what most states would find is that they have bilateral investment treaties with countries that do not bring any sustainable development uh, um, projects. There's no greenfield investment from most of these uh, these countries. And so the question then becomes, there's a need for each state to have a clear audit of what it is they need. Where is the inflow coming from? Where are these relationships coming from to ensure that these protections uh, that they're giving, they're actually giving to the right uh, people and not just leaving themselves open to anybody carrying a, a suitcase coming in and uh, taking billions off the state. Thank you, Victor. Uh, thank you so much, Emilia, for that intervention. We are running out of time, but I'll ask uh, a, a Doug just two minutes to just uh, uh, conclude uh, the discussion. Thank you. Um, well, th thank you very much um, indeed. And, and also, well, thanks very much for all the the uh, the contributions. Um, there are a couple of points hanging, I think, um, and and I'll, I'll I'll just discuss that I think briefly. Um, uh, I think you're right, Victor, that we need to talk um, at some point in more depth around um, the link between the financial services and the ACFTA. Um, I, I do think that's that's really important. Um, 
And so, uh, so there's a trading goods offer, but there's also a trading service offer, and countries have offered that, and they can do that. So, so Faisal is talking about Tanzania, for example, so it works through the East African community. Um, they already have um, uh, a liberalised services uh, sector to some extent, which goes beyond GATS um, uh, already. Um, and then they can also have country-specific commitments that they then uh, uh, send to the ACTA, and then you can get uh, requests um, from other countries to to your schedules, uh, and that process is um, is, um, is is ongoing uh, uh, at the moment. In the case of sort of the EAC, um, uh, I think they're 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 likely to offer sort of offering something which is in between EAC and GATS, so they're offering more to the their, their own region than they offer um, uh, to to AFTA as a whole, which which may be going beyond uh, what they offer to GATS uh, more, more generally. Uh, so you've got a bit of a hierarchy, hierarchy there, but but I think not all countries actually have offers that are gets plus. Uh, so if you look through it, there's very little there. Perhaps in other cases there's there's a bit more. But the question I think really becomes is, does that this then lead to more more discussions uh, around a more pro service sector approach, a pro pro private sector approach uh, at the country level? And I think how can we then encourage that? And I think I also want to link that to to maybe Faisal's, I don't know whether he wants to respond now or maybe a point later, but I think what I think is important is that this is now an opportunity for African countries to come together to, to, have, to create their own provisions um, that perhaps can lead to a, a more favourable investment framework. But how do we know that it is a more favourable framework uh, rather than only just thinking ex post uh, that that it has attracted more investment therefore it may be, <laughs> be more but, but how do we know how do you recognize that this is something that the private sector wants that will do it and that the countries do it and, uh, and other because uh, otherwise um, what you are asking for is a lot of patience which is justified and is really important um, uh, but I think uh, investors may be impatient uh, from within the countries, and they also want to understand sort of what is this new this new model going to look like. What is it that we want? What, how can we um, uh, uh, how can it bring fruit? Because as you say, we know what is needed. Implementation uh, is needed. We need to have these basic principles of of um, of, um, of predictability uh, of of the of the regimes regimes. I think the the last point. Um, uh, 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 Victor is around channeling FDI, and I think uh, I think we should also recognise that although we have, have focused on ACTA and trade and investment provisions um, and attracting investment and in making it work for for development um, and attracting investment, there's a whole host of other factors that are uh, possibly much more important. Right, so, uh, building appropriate uh, infrastructure, appropriate skills. Um, targeted coordination mechanisms um, are, are just as important as perhaps predictable rules uh, as perhaps the, the experience of, of um, if Ethiopia would, uh, um, would, would suggest because there it was a very targeted approach apart from Chinese firms to some other uh, Asian firms um, and it was a, a very targeted type of approach. Uh, but the question now, of course, it becomes how can the ACTA interact with that? So how can the ACTA lead to help you to do this more um, uh, than you had done done before? And I think that's from from that, that perspective, how do we see the ACTA in a wider in a in a wider perspective would be quite um, quite relevant. But I I've really enjoyed all the all the contributions um, and um, and and sort of the the the, the globally global wide global investment system. Uh, remarks on that, the China Africa remarks, the the, the Ethiopian Kenya specific remarks, and I think um, really we need to. This is an, an ongoing conversation. Uh, we do need to have patience, um, uh, but we need to work work at it. So it's not just patience and not do anything. It is actually actively helping to facilitate the debates, the dialogues, um, the many seminars that you you do, Faisal, uh, for example, that that others are are, are doing, and uh, I think that's really important to uh, to emphasize. Let me. Let me finish there, um, uh, Victor. Uh, thanks so much for uh, for sharing this uh, this long debate. I, I think we've kept you for almost two hours, so so thank you very much. It's a marathon session. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Doug, and thank you, Faisal. Thank you, Masa. Thank you, Sherin, and thank you, Hannah, who's just had to step off uh, to another meeting. Thank you, all participants. This is the final uh, seminar of the CGF this uh, academic year. We'll come you back uh, in uh, October uh, this year 
when the new academic year starts. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.